Good morning. Now, more than ever before, I am coming to understand that words about race matter, the ones spoken and the ones not spoken. My dad was a fundamentalist minister. I heard lots of sermons, but race was rarely, if ever, mentioned. My mother's family lived in Texas, and my grandfather's use of the N-word to describe Martin Luther King was ignored. Even on the long ride home, nothing was said about racism or the value of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Words about race not spoken. My dad's sister did genealogy research and shared family trees that included people who enslaved other people. Their last will and testimonies listed parcels of land and other property, and property for them included people. It was appalling to read, but it was not discussed. I put it in a folder and filed it away. Again, words about race not spoken. My life has been blessed with good education, family, and economic security. However, about three years ago, while still living in Minneapolis, I got a rather firm push from Common Ground Meditation Center to attend a Mindful of Race workshop by Ruth King. I had taught classes there for years, but frankly felt a little put upon to set aside three days for what? Another lecture about affirmative action? Nevertheless, I signed up and it turned out to be life-changing. Not in a bolt of lightning way, but a gentle, firm pivot a shift that required talking and words about race that needed to be spoken. The title of Ruth King's book is Mindful of Race, Transforming Racism from the Inside Out. And the active ingredient for me was her strong recommendation to form racial affinity groups. She says, and I quote, there is no shift in consciousness around race without the grit that relating to each other makes possible. In a race awareness group, we put ourselves in intentional spaces with people of the same race, where we can be safe enough to be vulnerable, challenged, and unedited, to examine the stories we have been told and the stories we tell ourselves, to lean forward toward what is familiar and away from what is habitual and to understand what is difficult to acknowledge, feel, and attend to within us and among us as a racial group, end quote. Wise words about race. Six of us formed an old white guy's race awareness group and we met monthly for two years. We shared our histories and experiences and gradually came to see more clearly our role in racial harming and healing. We read a lot, meditated together, and we learned how to be more vulnerable and acknowledge our ignorance, shame, and disgrace that accompany and accommodate racial inquiry. I had read ta Coates' classic article, The Case for Reparations, in 2014, printed it out, and filed it. I heard his words, but I was not ready to speak. The race awareness group changed that. For the first time, I felt in my body an energy, a sense of duty, a direction toward repair, reparations. Then an odd thing happened. After moving to Denver, I was running in my Capitol Hill neighborhood, and at the corner of 14th and Lafayette, I saw a banner hanging on the wall of a church that said, Black Lives Matter. It was a cool-looking building, and I had heard that Unitarians are an interesting bunch, so I visited and was blown away by the music and, yes, the words that were spoken, words that create action. I was inspired and motivated by Soul to Soul Sisters Workshop, meeting monthly for over a year with a, do a dozen or so of you in a reparation circle. We've challenged and supported each other and studied into action. We've helped establish a reparations affinity group to support the Denver Black Reparations Council led by Harold Fields, someone many of us know and love. 
The truth about recon reconciliation is that reparations are owed. Finally, words about race are starting to come. But I'm looking for some new words about race that will speak to 58% of white America who voted for a man who speaks about race and lies. Words matter. So what words do I, do we need to speak about race at FUSD to grow out of white supremacy culture and into a beloved community? Words matter. May we say what needs to be said about race and do what must be done. My life has been entirely unremarkable. I grew up in an upper middle class home in a white neighborhood in Los Angeles. My parents were liberal, non-religious Jews. It was a very comfortable life. I went to public school, then private college. I did what I was supposed to do. I studied hard, got good grades, and followed my parents' footsteps and became a doctor. I was successful in an average way. Until I read the book Waking Up White at FUSD in May of 2017, I thought my comfortable life was a result of my hard work and my family's culture that always placed a high priority on being educated. And then I woke up and learned about my white privilege and understood that the life I took for granted happened because of my white skin, not because of my hard work. I was embarrassed that this awakening came so late in life, but I'm so appreciative that it did come because it changed my life. I still don't understand why wanting to end white supremacy culture became the focus of my life. It's something about how I was raised, my core values of fairness, justice, and equity. Everything about systemic racism felt grossly unfair to me, and I wanted to do everything I could to change it. I made a conscious decision not to wallow in feeling guilty about my white privilege or that it took me almost my whole life to figure it out. Guilt would slow me down and serve no purpose moving forward, so I dismissed it. Instead, I read and I went to workshops and I talked to like-minded friends. I tried to become an activist. Some of us started a racial justice group at FUSD. The group thrived and still plays an important part in the life of our congregation. Some of us at FUSD decided we wanted to explore the idea of reparations in a more focused way. We met for a year and this led to a whole other avenue of learning for me. I began to think about how I live my life, how I spend my money, what organizations I donate to, where I invest my money. And I began to think about these things differently through a reparations lens. My husband David and I had some serious conversations about our values and how we express those values. We spoke to our adult children about inheritance and how white families passing their inheritance on to their children is one of the worst ways white people perpetuate continued wealth disparities. This part of my journey feels very worthwhile because I feel like it's something tangible that I can do to make a difference in our white supremacy culture. But the story can't end there. There is so much work to do. I still struggle with how to be a good ally. I have to live with the realization that Black, Indigenous, and people of color, BIPOC, see me, a white, older, well-meaning liberal woman, as dangerous. I want them to know I have good intentions, that I'm an ally, but they've been burned by people like me so many times. Besides, it can't be about me. I know from my readings that real allyship means taking on the struggle as your own and centering those who are marginalized. It does not mean getting approval from BIPOC, BIPOC for doing the work, but knowing something and internal, internalizing it so it is real are two different things. So I must continue to push myself to take risks, speak up, stay engaged. I know I can still wake up some days and not feel like focusing on systemic racism that day, but BIPOC folks don't have that luxury. I'm a perfectionist, so I continue to be afraid that I'll say or do something wrong, that I'll embarrass myself. I do make mistakes and it is embarrassing. It is important to apologize, learn from those mistakes and move on. Feeling paralyzed like feeling guilty performs no useful purpose. Better to let those feelings go and do the work. I want to end by acknowledging how grateful I am to FUSD for playing such an important role 
in my journey. It was here that I first discovered my white privilege. It was here that I made wonderful friends who are committed to learning and teaching about racial justice. It was here that I had the complete support and encouragement of Mike. It is hard to do this work alone. It is wonderful to have colleagues with whom I can be totally honest and who challenge me to keep engaged and move forward. My sincere thanks to them and to you all. Hey everyone, my name is Katherine Wiley and I'm a member of Boulder Valley Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. Uh, and I have on occasion joined First Uni Unitarian Society of Denver and enjoyed that. Um, so thank you for today for inviting my reflection on my my race journey, uh, as I'm calling it. <clears throat> so um, you could say that, uh, that basically the first crack in my race windshield, if you could call it that, um, occurred when I was 24 years old. I was in graduate school. It was the first day of class. And the subject was the history of African-American education. Uh, and my professor, she clicked the on button of uh of a recording that she had, and out came the voice of this um, very scratchy uh, old man. And he began talking about his life um, when he was younger, and he was a black sharecropper in the segregated South. And he, like many other black people during that time, taught himself to read. Um, and in his story, he said that the consequence of learning how to read was getting his fingers cut off by the white people in his town. Um, and that moment was so powerful for me. It left an impression that, you know, obviously eight years later, I have not forgotten uh, since. Um, it was the first time that I began to understand that, uh, that white supremacy um, was, was a thing and that it was violent and that it created horrific, horrific um, violence against black people and other people of color in this nation. And uh, definitely the second um, crack in that windshield was a couple of years later um, when uh, Trayvon Benjamin Martin was murdered. Um, you know, he shares the middle name of my white brother, but none of the skin privilege. And I, I saw in him someone who could be my family, um, and I was so, um, it was the first time where, where I really began to see that uh, black youth in particular um, cannot, cannot live the same life that white youth that my brother could. Um, and I followed the acquittal um, and then other acquittals of so many police officers, many of them white, who have uh, been uh, not been prosecuted um, for for the murder of black people and because of the history that I was beginning to understand and what I was seeing all around me in the world and you know of the last ten years, I, the through lines were were so apparent. Um, and so during that same time, I was also in an experience um, unlike nothing else that I had known before where on a daily basis, I was walking inside of a, a school um, where that was run by white people and treating many of the black children who attended school there terribly. And although on the outside, I was developing a race conscious, anti-racist identity, every time I walked into that school building, I felt so overwhelmed um, and incapable of of being the anti-racist advocate I wanted to be in that space. And um, I stayed silent, uh, and that sat with me um, for a very, very long time because as a white person in a, in, in a privileged position to be inside a school building where I had access to knowledge about how black children were being treated, staying silent was, was the wrong thing to do. Um, and it took me... A long time to finally uh, to to finally get the courage to go public with what I knew, um, and that set me on a next stage of my journey, where uh, that of really of of the advocate um, of the activist and using the information I had, I went to any official who would listen to me and um, and tried to really uh, right that wrong for me on a deep personal um, spiritual level, and. 
you know, that fueled a particular kind of work. I think um, it was it was a a righteous rage work. It was um, it was a it was in some ways a vindictive anti-racist work. I was so mad and so uh, so feeling so so angry and frustrated and disappointed at these institutions and public officials who, um, even in the face of all the evidence, turned away from addressing institutional racism, right? And so that set me, you know, on this next phase where having sort of come from the windshield cracking to um, an experience of being silent in the face of uh, of dehumanization, um, to speaking out about it, and now to a new place where it's something that I'm able to talk about a little bit more openly, publicly, still learning that part. Um, and it's definitely brought um, other other things to my work, like I take more of an anti-racist lens in my teaching now and still figuring that out as well. But um, but I think for me, the coming forward part has has really been the next phase and has ushered in a deeper sense of connection um, to to the complexity uh, and um, it's been a it's been a healing journey as well as a deepening of understanding of how how so many people can witness something horrible happen and not do anything about it and that's a lesson that I'll take with me from my own experience of having been one of those people um, to also seeing all around me the dozens and dozens of people that remain silent. Uh, about things that happen in their workplaces, in their schools, in their institutions. So with that new knowledge, I move forward into wherever this journey goes.